Please start, Pat. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the second in a seven part series by SCORE Fairfield County and our co-sponsor, Fairfield County Community Foundation. If you missed last week's webinar in the series, you can view the recording on Fairfield County's SCORE YouTube channel at any time. I'm Pat Duncan, the website coordinator and a business mentor here in Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. For those of you familiar with our webinars, there is an important distinction with this series. We will have a mentor reach out to you after today, and we're hoping that you will work with your mentor develop, to develop a plan to help you grow, whether you are an existing business or whether you're launching a new business but you will benefit from a review session with a SCORE mentor. And that's the program list. These are the topics to be covered Wednesdays for the next few weeks. If you miss any of them, you will be able to catch up by viewing these on our on-demand YouTube video, which will be available in a day or two after the original presentation date. Today's webinar is entitled, Running a Successful Business, What Really Matters, and is presented by Belinda Wasser. More on Belinda in just a minute. SCORE has 320 offices and 11,000 volunteers across the country. We are part of the Small Business Administration. And here in Fairfield County, we have 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry, process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value added services to small business owners. First of all, free one-on-one -on -one mentoring. This could be face-to-face, -face, telephone, email, video, Zoom calls, you name it. And these can be accessed by the request mentor link on our website or via the link on our screen today. Number two, we offer educational workshops and webinars of which this is one. We have over 150 per year. Number three, we have extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject matter experts at your disposal. I especially like the spreadsheets to help you form a business plan and also to do the P&L projections. SCORE puts on many webinars each month and you can look for future events on our calendar at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Now some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the Q&A window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at 1 p.m. precisely, and the session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at Fairfield County dot score dot org within the next couple of days. Now for our speaker, a business workflow and logistics expert with 25 years of experience, Rocket Girl Solutions founder Belinda Wasser is hired by small businesses on a contract basis to act as their part-time business manager. With a focus on helping her clients make more money, more efficiently and with less stress, Belinda's past and current work includes streamlining and improving systems, online payment setup and management, social media engagement, website builds, and marketing automation. So welcome, Belinda. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's just jump right in. So I have a feeling that as a small business owner and an entrepreneur, many of you feel just like this a lot of time. And so today, my goal is to focus on four areas where I see entrepreneurs um, lose their focus, um, but are so important that we're going to highlight them today. So we're going to just jump right on in. So today, we're going to talk about how to get a steady stream of clients or customers in a way that will probably surprise you. We're going to talk about the technology that you need to support you, handling your finances, and how to leverage yourself and how to delegate. Now, entrepreneurs have, um, they, they have, we'll call it an affliction <laughs> because that's probably what it is. And it's called shiny object syndrome. 
And shiny object syndrome occurs because we have so many ideas. We, you know, we're constantly doing research and we're looking into new things we can do and we have so many ideas. And what happens is that we never really settle on one thing to focus on and we don't get leverage. We don't get momentum and we don't, we don't end up successful because we're chasing that shiny object uh, all the time. And what I wanna tell you is that when it gets down to it, we simply can't afford this. This is, um, it's kind of a luxury, you know, that we indulge ourselves in, I think. And it makes us feel like we're in business and it makes us feel like we're busy, but it doesn't really get us to where we need to go in our businesses. What it really takes is a plan, a focused plan. And we're gonna talk um, about a couple of plans that I have in store for you that can get you there. And the thing that I have found interesting over my um, 10, 11 years of working with, with entrepreneurs and small businesses is that what is between this and this is going to probably surprise you and it's confidence. It's confidence, confidence to trust yourself, to know that you're on track, to look at certain key elements in your business, which we're gonna talk about, and to really trust yourself and to stop chasing that shiny object, which will definitely doom you. Um, it will doom your, your, your growth possibilities. And I say that from someone who used to have shiny object syndrome in quite a significant way. And the business that I had at that time, years and years ago, was not a success. And I attribute much of it to looking at my competition, feeling bad about what I was doing, and not really thinking about, okay, all right, I'm a business owner. What am I going to do to make this work? Now, the other thing that's critical, and it will help you build confidence, and it will also help you with shiny object syndrome is a lot of times we want everyone to, we want everyone's opinion. And that is also the kiss of death when you're an entrepreneur. So here's an example, you, you get, you decide you want a logo. Okay, great. So you hire someone and then you show 25 people your logo. Everyone has a different opinion, everyone, and and, and they're telling you and they're being very passionate about how, why they feel this way. And now you're stuck because you have all this feedback. You don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. You're unsure again, because you've asked too many people. Be clear about who you get feedback from. You want to find people who either have what you want or have already arrived where you want to be. So the last person you wanna ask for advice about something in your entrepreneurial adventure is someone with a job or is because they have no idea. That's, that's not the culture that they're in and that's not the experience that they're having. The other thing to keep in mind, and it took me a long time to figure this out, is that the people in my life want to protect me. They're absolutely, they have my best interest in mind. They just don't have the experience to give me good advice. And that's where SCORE comes in, right? You have SCORE, you have other people that you can trust with, um, with your questions, with your decisions, but be sure not to overwhelm yourself because you'll never get anywhere, all right? So we're gonna jump in. We're gonna talk about um, the important idea number one, which is a steady stream of clients. Because even if we're all set up and we're, you know, and we're in business without clients, without a revenue stream, um, we're really, we don't have the ball rolling yet. I wanna reiterate that if you have any questions, please put them uh, in the chat. It's right in front of me. And I wanna be able to answer your questions as they occur, including objections. Like if I say something and you think that's insane, I wanna know that as well, all right? So let's jump into a steady stream of clients. People come to me looking for clients. They're a little panicked because it's scary to put yourself out there, absolutely. And where they are looking it are all kinds of places. So they're asking me, where are the best networking places? What's my strategy for cold calling? What should I do on social media? Um, should I buy names? Should I buy a list of followers on Instagram or should I buy an email list? How should I prospect? Um, they wanna know about selling. They'll, I heard an entrepreneur talking to me just last week in a networking group and she said, I just hate selling. And, you know, then someone asked me the other day, 
should I take out an ad in the magazine, you know, in my industry, or should I, you know, should I advertise in some way? And while all of these things can help you, I think overall, none of them are a good strategy. And once in, in, independent of, of the others, or even really at all, my big strategy is not to sell myself, not to, um, not to prospect. I don't ch really chase people at all. And you know, what's, what's interesting is that someone asked me recently how I get clients and I had to think about it for a minute and my clients find me. And the reason that they find me is because of what I'm about to explain. My first question when someone comes to me, a client or friend, you know, kind of a little distressed, where am I going to get clients? And my first question is, how are you staying in touch with the people you already know? And what they say is, the people I already know are not going to hire me. They're not my ideal client. They're not going to be able to help me in any way. They don't understand what I'm doing. And it goes on and on and on and on. So let's look at six people who, un who are unlikely going to hire me of the over 230 something people that I've worked with over the last 10 years. And these are just the first ones that popped into my mind as I was creating this presentation. If I looked at all of those clients, I could draw a very specific line to keeping in touch um, in one way or another with the people that I know. So let's talk about the first one. Um, I, I don't want to say her name because her name is my Amazon um, dot and she will wake up. But um, my, my friend and client here lived across the street from me for about 10 years in Boston in a third store story walk up. So we saw each other a lot as we were lugging groceries up. Um, and she had, she is never not was not someone that I thought would hire me. But not only did she hire me, but she's referred to people to me over and over. In fact, it, I haven't seen I haven't seen her for probably I don't know, six or seven years. And she just referred someone to me recently. We're going to work on a project together on something that I wasn't even doing when I knew her. So this is very powerful. The woman in the middle, Sarah, she is the sister of a woman I met at a networking event. Rebecca over to the right is a vendor for a business that I had a long time ago. I stayed in touch. She has since started two new businesses and hired me both times. Diane is someone who was referred by a friend. Bob, in the middle here, the story with him was that I worked on a project with a lot of people from all over the country, and the, the web person would particularly impress me. And I thought, you know, I want to know more about his business, and I want him to know about mine, because I really, I really, you know, when I listened to him talk, I thought he knows what he's talking about. So we had a conversation to see if there was any possibility for us to collaborate in the future. And we realized that our skills were much too close for that to be likely. But we stayed in touch because he stays in touch with people as well. I get cards from him probably three times a year, you know, with an update. And when it came time for his client, Bob, to come to him for a specific need that he did not want to handle, he thought of me because I stayed in touch with him. Bob is my biggest client and is well into double digits every year. Um, for the last probably four or five years as a result of keeping in touch with someone who I really didn't even know that well, but I was impressed with. Rosalind over on the right and the bottom, I worked with her at a big corporation years ago, ran into her husband, who I did not know as her husband, at a networking event. I kept in touch with him, and when it came time for her business to start to grow and she wanted to hire me, he mentioned my name, she remembered me, and we've been working you know, together for years now. So again, very unlikely. So the criteria um, for all of this is to keep in touch with people that you like, people that you know. So let's break this down a little bit. Michael Katz is a client and a friend and a colleague, and his business is Blue Penguin Development. I highly recommend that you subscribe to his newsletter. It is just packed with lots and lots of good information. And he, this is something that I learned from him and it was really at the core of my business taking off in the beginning. So what he says is stay in touch with the people that you know over and over again and position yourself as a likable expert. And that is really the secret sauce at the core of me getting hired. I also have seen it with my clients as well. So it's not something that's just specific to virtual assistance work, or being a business manager, I have seen this be very successful with financial managers, 
um, uh, financial planners, um, uh, consult, marketing consultants, nutritionists, um, coaches, executive coaches, all different kinds of businesses. And I've also seen it work not only with service businesses, but with stores and product-based um, marketing as well. It's called, this is called relationship marketing. There's a lot written about it, but if you distill it down to its core, this is really um, what it's about. So let's, let's break this down. So the people you know. So you can see from the slide I just showed you a minute ago, this is, there's a very broad um, definition of that. It could be your college roommate. It could be, you know, your, like I said, your neighbor. It could be a mom or a dad that you were standing next to on the playing field with, you know, for years. And, and you, you don't even necessarily need to be in touch with them now. You can reach out to them now that you have your business. So over and over again, just like with anything, saving money, losing 10 pounds, you know, staying in shape, consistency is key. And there is no difference here. It's really a critical skill to be consistent. And positioning yourself as a likable expert, I want to bust a myth about being an expert um, in a couple of different ways. And then I'm going to give you six specific examples of how I've kept in touch with people to build um, a referral engine for myself. So, the first thing I want to talk about is um, publicity. I call this the Oprah Winfrey moment. So this, these are publications where my work has been featured over the last, um, the last 15, 20 years. And when I first was in the Wall Street Journal, which was the first publication that I uh, was mentioned in my website and everything, I thought I had won the lottery. I was set, I was done, you know, boom, that's going to be it. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I had this big ego boost. I put it on my website, which is really cool. Um, it enhanced my credibility, but there was there were no clients beating their way down, you know, to beating my door down. Some of this, some of these mentions were about product-based work when I had my online store. Um, years ago, I sold personalized baby products. And others, other mentions like Inc. and Young Fabulous Self-Employed Home Business, those were all about my Rocket Girl business. But really, no change at all in the business itself. I spent a lot of time daydreaming about th this moment when my life was going to change and probably wasted a lot of my shiny object syndrome time on this. So I just want to kind of put this where it belongs, which is it's super cool. And you might be the person who invented, you know, Zoom five seconds before the pandemic, but probably you're not. So I, I want you to focus on the long game, the, you know, the long play, which is what it takes for people like me to build a business over time. It's, it's really is a long game. So let's talk about the first, the first thing that I did when I started my Rocket Girl business, and that is I started a newsletter. The idea of writing a newsletter every other week or once a month was horrible. I had no desire to do this. I'm not a writer. It took a couple of days for each newsletter and honestly, a bag of potato chips because when I write, I'm a, I need to munch. Very um, uncomfortable. However, I kept at it. I got good at it over time and I've written over 200 newsletters. People, people respond to the newsletter. It's a way to get into a lot of inboxes all at once. And it really takes care of the criteria of staying in touch with people you know. It's important to ask them if it's okay to send the newsletter to you, to them, because you want it to be an opt-in, what's known as an opt-in list, permission-based list. This isn't about buying a ton of names, throwing them in, you know, in, and into your email um, marketing software, which we'll talk about in a minute and sending it out. It's really not about that at all. Notice a couple of things about this email. My picture is there. So people, and this is an old picture, this is an old slide, but people can, they see my face, they can relate to it. My current newsletter has my current um, headshot, which I recommend. You don't want to be stuck in time. If you are meeting someone, you know, for coffee and they get your newsletter, you want them to be able to recognize you. And there's lots of affordable ways to do that. So I have a message at the top that just goes into, you know, winter's coming, lucky for me, pal season has started, I'm really excited. Today we're going to talk about problem solving in your business. 
in particular, I explained how to um, slowly and methodically, you know, make improvements in your business. Then what happens is I go into an article. Now, a lot of people say, I don't want to spam people. I don't want to send it out to a list of people who are not interested. Um, what if I'm bugging them too much? I'm not suggesting any of that. I'm not suggesting selling to them. What I'm suggesting is providing them with useful content. And how many people here, I imagine if you could raise your hands, you all would have an email inbox that's out of control. So if I write about how to get a handle on your email inbox, that is interesting and useful. I'm in no place on this newsletter asking people for referrals. I'm not selling my services. I'm telling them step by step how to solve a problem that they're probably having or know someone who um, has that same issue. So I'm seen as a likable expert. And you can do that no matter what your industry. If you own a toy store, you could write about the top um, holiday gifts or birthday presents to give three-year-olds. Like, I have no idea. I, you know, there's so many, there's so many places where people are stumped and your expertise, while it seems very simple to you, will help a lot of people. So that's what I'm suggesting. Again, it needs to be very consistent. Um, I have this, and once you write this content, it becomes like a pot of gold because you put it on your website, you can use it on social media, and it becomes very, very valuable. When I started my newsletter, I had no idea what I was creating. Um, and now with these 200 posts, I really, I can turn them into videos. I can turn them into, um, you know, podcasts. I can turn them into webinars because I've already written the content and thought about it. I do zero research. I typically am answering a question that a client has asked me, like, how do I keep my files organized? So I'll write an article on that. So you just need to listen and listen to what your clients are saying and what your, what your customers are saying and just solve those problems for them. And it's very valuable. Another thing that's really nice to keep in touch is, uh, is called stay in touch emails. So what I do is um, twice a day, uh, not twice a day, <laughs> uh, I send two a day, once a day, Monday through Friday, an email just checking in with someone. So before this all starts, I've compiled a list of people that I know. I've connected with everybody on LinkedIn that I know, on Facebook. I've asked them for their email address. It definitely takes some effort, but once you do it, you have that very valuable list and, um, and you have all different kinds of possibilities then. So here you'll see I'm not selling anything in this email at all. Hi, Darby. Hope you had a nice weekend. I thought of you on Saturday when I was at the farmer's market. They had, you know, free range beef, and I know you love that. So I thought I would, you know, I would check it out. Things are going well. Business is busy. I'd love an update when I get a chance. So all I'm doing is popping in front of her. I mentioned business, but that's because I work a lot. And if I didn't mention business, people would think something was wrong with me. But I'm not selling to her. I'm not trying to do anything other than say hi. My signature is there. My contact information is there. My tagline is there. She knows what I do because I keep in touch with her and she's a friend and it keeps me top of mind. Now, if somebody does not answer you when you send this, you do not want to take it personally. You don't want to take that as a sign from the universe that you shouldn't be doing this. All it means is that they are like every other person on the planet and you fell below the fold of their email. That doesn't mean they didn't see your name. That doesn't mean they're not gonna answer you in a month. I have certainly done that, had people email me, keep it in my inbox, which is very clean, but keep it in there because I wanna act on it. So you really don't, you know, you really don't know. So we have a question. Great to discover you. Any advice relevant for artist designer as different from service providers? Yes, absolutely, Susan. So you are in the fabulous um, place of having something to show people other than your words. So what I would recommend is to take a piece of art that you've created. So have in the, in the newsletter, have your welcome, showcase your piece and talk about it. Talk about your inspiration in a brief way. You know, you don't want to go on and on about the story and have it be a jillion words, but you know, this is inspired by the landscape. I recently was on a trip and saw this scene. It caused me to be inspired, blah, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's great absolutely to, um, as a, an artist, a designer to showcase, you can also do things like, um, 
to showcase product, think, create art you've created for someone else. So I had a section in my newsletter for a long time. It was called, what did I call it? The long, I think it was the launch pad. And it was where I would highlight work that I did for clients. So a big congratulations to Martha for the launch of her newsletter. You can subscribe here. So you could do that. A big congratulations to my client, you know, to so-and-so who commissioned this piece from me, something like that. So I, I hope that answers your question. Heather says, how often do you send stay in touch emails? I missed what you said. So to, that's a good question. And I didn't actually answer that. So thank you. Um, so I send two a day, Monday through Friday. And the reason only two a day is because the last thing you want is for someone to sit, respond and then you miss it because the whole point is to keep the ball rolling. I recommend about once a quarter and you can create your list in a lot of different ways. I had one client who was very technology averse. So we took note cards and wrote the person's name on the note cards, put them behind, you know, in a recipe box and she would respond to them, put the date, put them at the back and she would just cycle through them. Or you could get, you know, a more complicated CRM that would pop the names up. But um, it's important that you, um, that you create a system that works. So Susan says, oh, so we have some things in chat. So one second. Um, so does an email like this risk seeming disingenuous? The reason it doesn't is because I'm not. So if you're authentic, then it won't seem like that. Um, it's not, I don't write the same email to everyone. I might say like the part here where it says things are going well, business is busy. I might copy and paste that into multiple email addresses, but I do, um, I do actually like them. I do want to keep in touch with them. And, um, and, and so that's why it works because it's, it's actually authentic, but that's a good question. I get that one a lot. What's the best way to hire a business manager for a design consultancy? That's a big question. The best way to hire a business manager well, I would definitely, all of my clients are referrals and I recommend that for sure. Um, you want to ask your network, you know, think about um, the question, you know, do you have a dentist, you know, and, you know, if you, someone loves their dentist, they can't wait to tell you about it. So that's a, that is a big question. I would ask people, I, and don't even be afraid to ask people who are in your industry because you know, depending on who they are, I help people in my industry all the time. In fact, I've made a business out of it. So um, I, I would say the best way to hire anybody really is to get clear on the kind of help that you want um, and to ask your network. There's a lot to say about that. And if we have more time, I will do that. So Susan says, um, but do get clear about what you want the help with. Susan says, I often stress management services. I can give stories of people who are helped, changing names, of course. Yes, absolutely, you can do that. Or you can talk about like, so here, here's a newsletter that I wrote um, a while ago. I went to a horse show. I, I was being very careful and I drove around a horse, a horse, um, what's it called? A horse holder, <laughs> a horse uh, trailer. There's a guy up next to the trailer. And as soon as I got around to the other side going like zero miles an hour, he screamed at me and he said, why would you ever go around a horse trailer? Isn't it obvious to you what's happening? Well, it actually wasn't. And so it probably was not my finest moment. I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but it caused me to think, you know, it's obvious to him. I think I said, it's obvious to you, but it wasn't to me. And, um, and I wrote a newsletter about the things that are obvious to me that my clients don't know about, you know, and you can think about whatever those are in your business. So lots of different ideas. You can, you want your clients and your prospects to see themselves in your stories, to see themselves, but in a newsletter can be as simple as something like once a year, listen to your voicemail, make sure that the, you know, that the, that it's not too long, that you sound happy and that the information is right. Um, opt in for your freebie on your website to make sure it works. You know, so it can be, it should be very, very simple things. You're not trying to get the prize for being the smartest person on the planet. You're trying to get the prize for being approachable, knowledgeable, and friendly. Okay. Good questions. Thank you. All right. So let's jump in a little deeper. All right. So social media. 
Social media is important. I want you to think of it as passive behavior though, okay? The, the newsletter and the email, um, and the stay in touch email is much more active and it takes action in order for this to work. However, this is a nice thing to do as well. So you want to do what's called linking in. Uh, this is just stuff, I words I've made up. Linking in in that you, um, in that you, you know, post your stuff, you know, thank you for the speaking engagement. Here's my latest article, things like that. However, you also want to comment and engage with other people's posts. So here's my client, Bob, who I mentioned earlier. He wrote an article, why don't you pursue organic growth? And I wrote, thanks for another great article, Bob. So what happens here is he gets notified. My network gets notified. That, so I'm helping him with his reach on social media. And one time I did this with someone who what she was dating one of my friends a long time ago. He got on my email newsletter list because I asked him. I didn't know him that well, but I knew he was a serial entrepreneur and I knew he was kind of a hot ticket. So I, I asked him if he could would be on my newsletter list. I saw on LinkedIn that he started a second business and I said, way to go, congratulations. And it was a little scary how fast my phone rang because he wanted help. And he immediately, because he knew who I was, because he got my newsletter, because I stayed in touch with him in some way, it was kind of a no brainer for him to call me because I had already sort of proven myself. You know, he knew people I knew that he trusted. Um, he got my newsletter. He saw me on social media. And here I was re essentially reaching out to him. So things like this work as well. It's, it happened, but this is not, um, this is not the only way. Like I said, this is more of a passive, a passive way. You also want to stay in touch with clients that you already have. So without getting into a, a lot of detail, people prepay my time when they want to work with me in five or 10 hour chunks. The time is good for a year. And um, I call it the rocket girl debit card. It's a virtual debit card. So every Monday, what I do is I send them a, an email that tells them how much time they have left and they can, it tells them when it expires and it shows them a, a link where they can renew. So what I've created is a self-service way for people to add time to their debit card, their virtual debit card so that they continue working with me. The reason I started this was two reasons. One, I wanted to be in front of them to let them know, you know, don't let your time expire. This is how much you have left. And I wanted them to also reload their debit card with their credit card, but you know, buy more time when it was time. But I also wanted to jump in front of them. And this was the real reason I started it. So they would hit reply and say, hey, while you're in my inbox, let me give you this work. And it definitely happens. So you want to, just because they've already bought, you don't want to ignore them. And you want to make sure they're on your newsletter list, you're engaging with them on social media. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, all right, so someone says the debit card is something I was discussing with my mentor. How do you do this, though, and not have people cramming all the time at once? That, um, that would be your dream, actually. <laughs> um, so with the debit card, I'm joking, but with the debit card, that, that just doesn't happen. It's on my website. People always talk to me before... Um, they buy a debit card. Like I said, I've worked with, you know, over 230 or 40 people and um, that's never happened. That, that will not be your challenge. Your challenge will be, you know, the, op the opposite, um, having a steady stream. And I've also, um, I've set this up for clients in different industries. And um, just to further uh, make the point, I have another business where I train virtual people to be virtual assistants. I have a community of 13,000 people. Many of them have set up the debit card, you know, for themselves, and that just doesn't happen. So you don't need to worry about that. In the same way, I have a link on my website um, to um, to get on my calendar for an appointment. And again, with the one exception of April of 2020, when everyone was kind of panicking, um, I've never been overrun. Um, and that month, I I was and I was able to manage my schedule and stop that. But um, people don't. Um, they, they, they just really don't do that. Now, I have currently 43 active clients, but what happens is they all don't need me all the time. 
you know, my client Bob needs me five, six, seven hours a week, but the rest of them, they, you know, they need me an hour here, an hour there, a project comes in and I just manage my priorities and I manage my timelines. So for example, a newsletter, someone wants me to format came in last night and I have time this afternoon. So I said, no problem, we'll do it. However, if I already had my day scheduled and I had other deadlines, I would say, does Friday work for you? And we go from there. So work comes in at, in different amounts, um, but you, I just am prioritizing it all the time. I, I put it on my calendar so I can see it and, um, and just move blocks around. And Heather says she loves the debit card idea. It's really good. I do not chase debt. I am not chasing, you know, creating invoices. It's worked very, very well. And my clients love it. They love it. Okay. So thank you for those questions. Let's move on. And I just want to talk quickly about snail mail. This is something that people have sort of forgotten. This is a handwritten note. One of my clients is having a bad day and, um, I, uh, and I sent her a note. You know, I have a little fun with the whole rocket girl thing, and I'm sure there are ways that you can have fun with your brand as well, or something that, that you like. I, I'm a chicken, um, chicken backyard chicken keeper, a chicken tender, I think is what they call us. And um, so I have fun with that as well with my little chicker doodles. Um, and I'm going to have some fun with you with the chicken in just a little bit. So here's a handwritten note that I sent her. I sent her some eraser toppers, and this is the picture that she posted of this in her kitchen on Facebook. So it was great. I sent it to her and her way of, you know, sort of um, paying it back or forward was to highlight me in her social media. So things like that happen because, you know, I teach my clients to do the same thing. And then also note card, not note cards, um, greeting cards. So this is a card that my web, uh, not my web guy, my graphics guy, Mark, Mark Tatro, he um, set up for me. It's meant to be kind of fun, you know, operational idea of the month. Um, and um, inside is a tip about running your business. So these are really fun things that I've done in the past. Now, in order for this to be successful, just like anything, if we track it, it's going to work. So this is an Excel spreadsheet. And what I recommend is picking one or two things to start out and building the muscle and then adding something else. I did not, if I did not start doing everything that I do now, I would drown. I would never be able to keep it up. So pick one maybe the stay in touch emails. Um, and you can even say something like, um, I was just cleaning out my address book and I came across your name. I can't believe I have not been in touch with you for 10 years. I bet your girls are all grown. You know, this is what's been going on with me. Just don't make it really, really long because they won't answer it. And then, you know, I'd love, or it'll overwhelm them. And, you know, I'd love an update from you just to get back in touch. It doesn't have to be, you know, the story of your life. People love that. They love that. Think about that. You know, when people have done that with me, they, you know, out of the blue, I was just thinking about you. I saw something you gave me. It was really cool. And, um, and I, I, th I think it's nice. So don't think about this as, you know, torturing people that you're staying in touch with. Think about it as a way to be a communicative, authentic, nice human being. It actually makes you feel good when you get this rolling. It is scary at first because, you know, you feel like you're really out there, but you're not as out there as you think. So definitely track it. I typically, in the beginning of doing this, I would print it, have it on my desk, and I would handwrite it in because it was a way to keep it in front of me. Um, and I didn't do everything I said I was going to do, but, um, but I would have to look at it. Oh, thank you, um, Brigida. Hi, Brigida. What do you enter in the chart? Check in emails, in-person meetings. Are you entering the client's name to keep track or just a check mark that you did it? Thank you, that's really useful. So typically what I do is I would do this, if I did this in Excel, I would make this cell bigger and I would put the people's names in. Um, you can do check marks. If you've got a system where you're tracking who you're in touch with and when, you know, like a, a CRM, then you could just check, do the check marks knowing that another system is tracking it. If you want to track it yourself here, then I would make these rows, um, rows um, deeper and put the people's name. You know, the newsletter was just like, yes, posted social media, yes. You know, it could be check, check, um, attend a networking event that I would probably write the networking event there. Um, yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, great. So let me just, I've answered some of these live. Let me just dismiss the questions so we can keep current. Okay, good. So any questions about that? That's a big one. That's a really big one. And so that's why I wanted to dedicate most of our time to it. Because um, 
a lot of people um, struggle to get clients, but I got to tell you, this works, works, works. All right, we're going to sort of buzz through technology because technology is different for everybody. What I want to give you some key points. And the first one is you want to have technology that supports you. You don't want, I, I see a lot of people um, who, someone says they need a CRM and they come to me and say, I need you to help me um, set up a CRM. And I say, great, well, you know, what are your objectives? Um, I don't know, I just know that I need a CRM. Okay, well, what problem are you trying to solve? Well, everything's fine, but I think I need a CRM. You don't wanna do that. You really want the, um, the technology to support a problem you're having, a solution you need, and you want to be thoughtful about it. I'm going to buzz through the solutions that I use because I, I want you to see that when you're an entrepreneur, there's rarely an all-in-one solution. In some industries, there are, um, like, what's the one that I use? And I have a client who's a nutritionist, and she uses uh, Get Healthy. And that handles most of what she needs with her clients. She, they can take pictures of their food and you know they can track different things with her. But for the most part, a lot of us have to piece this together. So let's just um, buzz through some of these tools that I use. Toggle is how I track my time. Um, since I get paid for hourly, it's important to me to handle that. MailChimp is how I send out my email newsletter. You can also use Constant Contact or MailerLite or many, many, many others. Um, as I mentioned, I get paid with credit card. Stripe is how I do that. It's integrated right into my website. Really, no matter if you are a Mac user or a PC user, you need Microsoft um, Office. At you need at least um, Excel, and Word and maybe PowerPoint, depending on what you're going to be working on. If you're a Mac user and you have pages and numbers, it can be pretty frustrating to people that you're that you're working with. So I, I highly recommend making this investment unless you live in a totally Mac world. Dropbox is really, what I want you to do is think about how you organize your files. I chose Dropbox. You can also, there are many other products I like keeping everything in Dropbox because they all my files are on all my devices. If I'm on my uh, laptop, everything's there. My iPad, so I can move. I can move because a part of my work as a virtual assistant and a virtual business manager is being able to, you know, be anywhere and do the work. So Dropbox helps me with that, and they also keep a backup and they keep versions for up to six months. So if I overwrite a file, which I have done. Um, you can easily back out of that without losing your work. Um, this is Pandora. I listen to music all day long. I consider it a tool. You know, there are tons of others, you know, Spotify, Apple, um, but I do consider this um, a tool. So um, someone's asking, is that paid or free Dropbox? Um, you can use free Dropbox as long as you don't hit the um, what a, a storage, storage limit. So I use um, paid Dropbox. I have like an enterprise account. However, you do not need to start with that. Here's, and I'm glad you asked that because I didn't think about mentioning this to you. Always start for free. As soon as you hit up against something that's really critical to your work, upgrade. But don't upgrade and, you know, because your potential is there. Most of the time, the functionality is the same except for something that you're not currently using that you need now. So please um, save your resources um, for that. Google Drive as well. We're going to talk about that in just a second, Kim. Thank you. LastPass is key to being safe if you're sharing passwords. LastPass, there's a, a bunch of other ones, but you want to be able to share your passwords if you're going to delegate, which we're going to talk about in a minute, in a responsible way so that, um, so that people can log into your accounts, but they can't necessarily see your password. Project management, if you're delegating, can be very useful. There's lots of different ways to do this. And again, in this one hour talking about these four um, important topics, I can't go deep, but you can certainly watch the replay and do some investigation on your own about these different things. Google Workspace is another important tool um, for, for um, you can use Gmail with your, with your domain. So my email address is not rocketgirlsolutions at gmail.com. It's Belinda at Rocket Girl Solutions. However, I use Google and the way that I do that is with a paid Google account. You can use free as well, 
Um, and most of the functionality is, is the same. Okay, and then, um, so that gives you sheets, uh, drive, docs, lots of other, lots of other tools. And then Evernote is how I keep my client notes. Um, it's very easy. Each client has their own note. Um, and when I'm working with them, I make notes at the top and it, the information keeps moving down and it's easy to search. Okay, so let me just get a couple of questions here. So Victor says, um, please, uh, what's the benefit of a CRM? Benefit of a, of a CRM. So I want you to, I want you to look at it as an address book. So if you have Outlook, you know, if you had a corporate job, you probably had Outlook and you can put information into that. You can also do that with Gmail. CRMs can be very sophisticated and very expensive. Most of us do not need that. I really just need an address address book. And because I'm not using Outlook, um, I needed to buy a CRM to use. There's tons of them out there. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> hmm. So, but CRMs can do things like, if you send them an email and they click, you know, they get a second email, they can be very sophisticated, but most of the time we don't need that. Glenn says he loves Pandora. Any insights, suggestions for a good online mobile bank, <coughs> excuse me, to connect payment systems to Stripe PayPal? Um, I lose, sorry, you guys. <coughs> this has never happened before. Mm. I'm glad I have my tea. Um, I don't have recommendations. I use my local bank. Well, it's actually a nationwide bank that is a local branch, but you can Google that. I've done that recently. I'm not really in a position to make um, a suggestion about that, but definitely um, when I Googled it, I found a list of the top six online banks and they can be great because they don't, um, they don't have fees. And Kim wants to know if we can use the free version of Evernote. Absolutely. And the key is as soon as you hit some up against something that, you know, you think I really need that and that's worth X number of dollars to me, then go ahead and upgrade for sure. Okay, so those are tools. I could do two hours on tools, but just, you know, think about um, free, a little bit at a time, and please do not pay for tools you're not using. And we're going to talk about that right here as we segue into managing your finances. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of zoom through this as well. So, you know, banking and bill paying used to look like this. And I think that, um, it was probably better for us than this because what happens is we see things on our phone. We think we have an understanding of our business. And I'll tell you from experience, we actually don't. So what you want to do um, first off is you want to have a business bank account. You want to separate your money. And even if your business is not making money and you're funding it, put that hundred dollars, that $50, however much it is, in your business bank account and then spend it out of that so you can track it. And there's a ton of other reasons, um, but really believe me, you, you wanna do that. It's really a best practice. Review your bank statements every single month, either print them out and use your finger or go over them line by line. And I want you to know what every single expense is. And I don't want you to pay for things you're not using. And the reason I say that is, you know, at one time, probably all of us have had a gym membership that we weren't using. But if we stopped it, it meant that we weren't going to do it and we didn't want to give up on ourselves. So we kept paying for it. Software is the same way. I, I know from experience. So you want to make sure that you're not paying for things you're not using. You can always reopen that account or start, start again. All right. So please make sure that you're not doing that. And you want to create revenue projections. So I'm going to walk through the math of this really quick. First, I'll give you the formula, and then I'm going to show you an example so that you can understand. Okay. So a financial projection sounds like this big thing that's really complicated. It's not. So what you want to do every month is figure out how much money you've made that year. And that should be um, pretty straightforward to do because I want you to track your revenue. Then I want you to divide that number by the month number. So April would be four. Then I want you to multiply that by 12. So here's how this works and how you can know where you stand. Let's say you made $50,000 um, January through April. 
So that you want to divide it by four. So your average month is $12,500. Then you're going to multiply that by 12. And you know that if things stay as they are, you're going to make $150,000. If the next month in May, you make $1,000, and your, you know, then your average changes and your projection changes. So by looking at this every month, you can make mid course corrections. Like you can say, okay, so if, if I have a slow month, do I need to keep in touch with more people? Do I need to look at my products? Do I need to network? What do I need to do? But you don't want to be at the end of the year working yourself to, you know, a nub and not making any money and not even know that that's happening. So please be sure to do this. Okay. So let's look at the questions. This is, okay, so um, Susan says, read the address book, what are good sources specifically? Um, you can look at Copper, Nutshell, Insightly, um, those, and there's one another, Capsule. Look at those four. Um, the one, you just wanna make sure that you like it and that it works for you. And don't worry about um, you know where your business is going to be in three years. Just worry about where it is now, and you know in the next year, because my business has changed so much. It's it's really hard to um, predict what's going to happen. Um, and someone said Kim says a CRM makes it easy to email to a list of thirty or more. Yeah, so you can use a CRM to do an an, an email blast. Absolutely, you can. Yes. Okay. So now um, I'm going to buzz through delegating. But delegating is really important, and I want to talk about it because, because people are prone to not want to do it. It's really scary, and we're afraid that we're afraid of a lot of things, and I'm going to address those. And the first thing I want to talk about is just because you know how to do something doesn't mean you should. There are ways that you want to leverage yourself. And I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. Now, the number one thing that I hear is that I can't afford it. And this is really a chicken and an egg situation. This is not my actual chicken, although I have had chickens that look just like this and they are that cute. You, in order to get out from under it, I spent years thinking I needed to work harder, longer, harder, longer. And then I was gonna finally get to that place where I could take the plunge. And it does not happen that way. What happens is you take the plunge and you don't sacrifice your time. You, you know, you might have to spend your money differently, but by starting to delegate, you're going to free yourself. You're going to free yourself up in a way that I couldn't have even imagined. So let's talk about the trade-offs. When you're delegating, the person you delegate to is probably a lot faster than you. And when you delegate them, you're freed up to do other work. So here's an example. I know how to do a lot of stuff in WordPress, but I also do not know how to fix a plugin when it's broken. My web guy though, Barry does. He charges about the same amount that I do per hour. If I do it, it'll probably take me three hours and I'm gonna be upset about it. I'm gonna be frustrated and mad and my energy is gonna be terrible. If I get Barry to do it, it's gonna take him an hour so I've gained back two billable hours. And even though I've spent money on him, I've actually made more. And so I want you to start to think about it that way because you'll start to get out from under it. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna have space to innovate and you're not gonna be underneath your business all the time. You're gonna have some good ideas. You're gonna be able to take your good ideas that you already have to the next place because you're not um, underneath the work all the time. And that's when your business is gonna start to grow when you do this. So let's talk about things that you can delegate. Repetitive tasks, you know, things that you do over and over again. Um, and I'm gonna show you um, one of mine that I've delegated in the past. Specialty tasks, technical, like in the case of my web guy, my graphics guy, tasks where I no longer add value. So let's jump in and talk specifically about a task where I no longer add value. And just for um, the SCORE facilitators, I'm aware of the time, thank you. And we're gonna end on time. So this is my client onboarding. I sat down and I thought about all of the different things that needed to happen when a client was onboarded. 
okay? And what's really great about that is that I thought about it all at once. It wasn't a reaction to a new client. So I send them a welcome email, I add them to toggle. So that what happens is when I um, handle all this, when the client starts, I'm ready to go. You can see that the, each thing is specific. So you want, when you delegate, you get delegate, you wanna set clear responsibility, bite-sized, clear steps. You wanna share the why, because when you're sharing with someone who you're delegating to, they might ask a couple of questions that could change the whole game for you and make it even better. You wanna determine deadlines. You wanna be the one that says, can you do this by? Because that's when huge misunderstandings are made. Um, I have a client that one client will say no rush and she means you like today by the end of the day would be good and I have other clients that no rush means you know in a week so you need to um, as the delegator make sure that that's clear and also make sure you have the right person for the job there are things that clients have asked me to do that are not my secret sauce and I'm sure to tell them other people might not be um, so confident to tell them, and so you need to ask that question because really, dele you know, delegating to someone, this is really, um, it's a relationship and you need to tr treat it that way. And if you have not delegated successfully in the past, I invite you to look at those steps and see where there might be some improvement. So just to remind you, we talked about um, these uh, important areas, getting a steady stream of clients without stress, using the technology to support you, not because it's cool or someone thinks you need it. Handling your finances, really being on top of that and how to leverage. So I'm gonna turn it over to SCORE. Um, unless you guys have some questions, um, please put them in the box. I'd love, to, um, I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Oh wait, here's another one. Um, Susan asks, uh, you mentioned your national bank. Have you found online banking safe with whom, which banks, asking because I'm thus far all local physically receipts. Um, oh, okay, so, um, and you're above the FDIC insured deposit amounts. Um, that's a good question. Um, my bank, which I'm not recommending, but I use is Wells Fargo. Um, I use them because it worked with my family. Other family members had accounts. We needed to move money around. And, um, and that's why I chose them. I, I do not have a ton of information about banks, but if you have, um, you know, if, if I, I can't tell if you're saying you have amounts above the FDIC insured amounts. And if that is the case, I would definitely um, investigate a financial planner um, to help you with that. Um, but that's, that's a good question. Uh, Brigida says, what tool are you using for client onboarding? Um, client onboarding, um, I, so you essentially you need a checklist. I used, um, at, in that screenshot, I was using teamwork, which is not inexpensive. Um, I'm managing a lot of work, but you could put that checklist in a Word document, print it out, check it down, recycle it. Okay, so, um, all right, let's see. Glenn says, Dele oh, she's helping, thank you. Someone was asking, what can you delegate? Repetitive tasks, technical, oh, no, it's a question here. Or I'll just go right back. Repetitive tasks, specialty tasks, tasks where you no longer add value. So for example, I don't add value in um, someone adding my client to toggle. Like I already figured out how to do that. Um, and I don't need to um, be involved with that anymore. Okay, um, see if there's any questions. Will we get a copy of the webinar? SCORE will be posting it to their website and they will, uh, I don't know if they will alert you when that happens, but we're gonna have Pat come on in just a couple of minutes after your questions and I bet she can answer. So on, it'll be on YouTube. So check out the YouTube channel in a couple of days and, um, and it should be right there front and center for you with a lot of other very valuable webinars. Okay, so do we need a landline in addition to a cell number? I do not have a landline and I, um, I have not had one for a long time. When my daughter was born, I didn't want to be out of the house and have someone calling me saying something was up. So I have my cell phone. We do have a cell booster in the house because I live in the woods and I live in a long skinny house and it was hard to get good service. 
um, but I was able to get that from my provider. Um, okay, we're going to have to stop. Because okay. Back. Thanks loads, Belinda. It was, this was great. And yes, you can go to our website and get a copy of this in a couple of days. And don't forget, someone will be calling you to follow up with your plans within the next week. So in closing, a big thank you to Belinda. This was wonderful, great information. I really appreciate it. And I've seen you three times now and I take copious notes each time. So <laughs> there you. you go. <laughs> thank you. It's always my pleasure. I love SCORE. You're a great resource for business owners. Okay, gang, we're going to uh, close off now. <laughs>